SACPA acknowledges that this event takes place on the lands of the Blackfoot people and Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3, and we pay respect to their past, present, and future cultural heritage, beliefs, and relationship to the land. SACPA commits to assist reconciliation efforts by raising awareness of the ways past and present injustices can be reconciled. Our speakers today are on the topic the Lethbridge Drug Treatment Court. Chelsea De Groot is the Regional Director for Drug Treatment Courts in Southern Alberta and Brett Carlson, lawyer, is with Legal Aid Alberta and is duty counsel in the Drug Treatment Court in Lethbridge. Would you please join me in welcoming our speakers. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Uh, yes? Okay. <laughs> I'm not a big fan of the mic, but we'll try to make do here. All right, so my name is Chelsea. I am the regional director for the Lethbridge Drug Treatment Court, and I also oversee the Medicine Hat Drug Treatment Court in Southern Alberta here. So really the whole purpose of drug treatment court is to create safer communities by reducing drug-driven crimes. And so we'll kind of go into the program, what that all looks like, and I'll try to sum it up in a nutshell here, because usually this presentation takes about an hour. <laughs> So I also have a land acknowledgement, but I won't go through that because Violet did a wonderful introduction of acknowledging the land. So what is Drug Treatment Court? So Drug Treatment Court is contained within the criminal justice system and operates with the same legal framework that governs all adult criminal court proceedings in the Provincial Court of Alberta. So the drug court operates based on guilty pleas with a delayed sentence process following section 722 of the criminal code with entry being dependent on the consent of the crown, court and the accused. So we'll kind of go through how somebody even gets into drug treatment court in a little bit here. Uh, the Drug Treatment Court program is founded on national and international principles for the drug treatment courts. It's committed to committee, community justice and restoration and is support service program under the direction of McMahon Youth Family and Community Services Association. So the purpose of Drug Treatment Court is to reduce drug abstinence for the participants of the program. So all participants, even if they are active in their addiction coming into the program, they do have to go to treatment and have to be sober. Uh, we provide support to participants to address the issues behind their addiction. So lots of times there's a myth that people just choose to be addicted to drugs. That is not the case. There's often so much underlying trauma um, behind the addiction and the addiction becomes a coping mechanism for them. We also support participants to change the criminal and addictive thinking patterns and so criminal and addictive thinking is a 12-week course that we also run that every participant has to attend to be able to um, graduate at the end. We also give participants the opportunity to become productive contributing members of society. We restore justice by reducing criminal recidivism and victimization in community. And so part of drug treatment court is they have to give back to the community and complete 100 volunteer hours during their time in the program. And then we also reduce overall expenditures of the justice and human services system. So for those of you who may not know, it is very expensive to house an inmate and jail is not always the answer. So DTC serves people who exhibit high risk with respect to their level of addiction, risk of relapse, and risk of returning to a life of crime. So we're really looking at high risk, high need populations to uh, come into drug treatment court. They have to be looking at an early case resolution offer of one to five years of custody, and that is for their drug related offenses. So usually it's people who are committing crimes to feed their drug habit or trafficking drugs, but we do not take commercial drug dealers. And so commercial drug dealers are people who are not necessarily trafficking for their addiction, but they're trafficking for means of money. Um, participants also cannot have a recent history or of significant violence, and they can't have gang involvement or affiliation. They have to be addicted to drugs. Um, they can be addicted to marijuana and alcohol, but those can't be their primary drugs of choice to be eligible for drug treatment court. And they have to be genuinely motivated to make changes in their life. 
so how somebody comes into drug treatment court is a referral is made to the Crown. So usually the applicant is with a lawyer. Hopefully they have one. If they don't, well, they need to obtain one uh, to make their application. And then the Crowns, we have uh, designated Crowns, one or two, usually, <laughs> provincial Crowns, one federal Crown who will screen for safety and to ensure that their charges are eligible for drug treatment court. And if they pass that screening phase, then they go on to the police. And so we have a Lethbridge police officer and an RCMP officer who are assigned to drug treatment court as well and then they screen also for risk to staff and risk to community. If the participant then passes that screening phase, they come to my team. And so uh, we're referred to as the treatment team. And so then we screen for motivation. And so we're really looking at how motivated is this person to change their life? Because it's not a get out of jail free card and drug treatment court is a very difficult program. Um, so they have to be pretty motivated to want to do different and to change people, places and things. And then if they are um, eligible, we feel that they're motivated, we make the recommendation to the rest of the team. And so we'll, I'll kind of go through what our team is, or who our team is made up of in just a second here. Um, and then they become a part of the observation phase. And so then they're expected, we'll give them some tasks to do, like maybe it's call us every single day at 8.30 to see how motivated they are to actually you know, keep in touch and, and to do some of the things that uh, we ask them to do. And then if they can do those things, then they enter guilty pleas and become an actual participant of drug treatment court. Yeah, so I guess we'll, we'll look at the services involved for drug treatment court. So there's judicial supervision, there's treatment, there's random and regular urinalysis testing, so we conduct all of our drug screening that is observed. Um, they have to call into a drug screening line every morning by 9 a.m. to see if they're randomly selected for drug screening that day. Uh, we operate on a sanctions and rewards model, and so that is part of the best practice. We have coordinated case management and social support service. So our multidisciplinary team, Brett and I also were a part of that team. Uh, so we have two judges that are attached. So the participants don't come to court and see a random judge every time. It's really based on that relationship piece. And so there's two judges. Like I said, we have provincial and federal crowns attached, duty council, uh, a designated probation officer, a Lethbridge police officer, RCMP officer, and then the treatment team, which is the case managers and myself. And then I have a boss as well. So some of the objectives for a drug treatment court are housing. So all of our participants have to reside in Lethbridge. So if they're coming from external communities, like we've taken people from Claire's home, uh, some of the reserves, uh, Tabor, they do have to move into Lethbridge and we help them find housing in order to do so. Uh, we offer physical and psychological support, so they have to have full medicals completed and participate in counselling. Um, sometimes the full medicals are a little bit difficult, as we all know, the doctor shortages are a real thing here. Um, but we do have somebody that is willing to work with us to assess them so that we can um, ensure that they're in decent enough health that they can participate in the program. Um, relationships is a huge piece of what we do and so we want to make sure that they're working on building healthy relationships and working towards their goals. Community restoration, so as I said, they do have to complete those 100 hours of volunteer. Some of our guys have completed well over 200, so the point is to really give back to the community that they once stole from. Uh, parenting skills, so for those that have children, we do put them in parenting groups to enhance those skills. Cultural supports, if people have a desire to connect to their culture, we will make appropriate referrals. We have a really good relationship with the Indigenous Recovery <coughs> Coach here. Literacy support, lots of times people struggle with reading and writing which also impedes their ability to maintain employment and so we will work with community partners and getting them connected to support so that they can work on their literacy income support so all of our participants cannot work the first three phases of the program because drug court is their full-time job and when we say that we really mean that they have no room for anything else um, so they have to go on income support and then in phase three which we'll talk about in a little bit here um, that's when they can start looking at going back to school or obtaining employment but we really want to stabilize them in their recovery before we introduce worker education to them uh, criminal addictive thinking like I said that's a course that they have to uh, attend and um, that group really addresses the distorted thinking patterns that they have and then treatment, everybody has to go to residential treatment um, and sometimes they go more than once depending on what we feel is best for them. Uh, education vocational training, they are supported through this process once they're able to return to work or school. Legal issues, so the reason we have Brett is if any other legal issues come up for them, they have somebody that they can uh, speak to. So their lawyer that represents them through their application process, if they're 
admitted into drug treatment court, their lawyer goes off the record and Brett becomes um, their new duty counsel. A relapse prevention plan, so all of our participants have to complete a relapse prevention plan and it's completed in two steps. So one early on in the program and one later as they um, are getting closer to graduation. And then we also offer an aftercare program. So once somebody graduates or graduates, they're still on probation for one year after graduating. And so we do still do follow-up assessments <coughs> with them every three months. They are still expected to come to court every three months. Um, and then they become part of an alumni group that uh, can continue to receive supports as needed. So we never really let them go. They're always part of the aftercare program. So our outcomes for drug treatment court is, of course, we want to eliminate drug use for participants, eliminate homelessness. We want to support them in changing criminal addictive thinking patterns, reduce justice through re reduced crime, recidivism, and victimization in community. <coughs> and then, as I kind of said too, we're, we're saving money by rehabilitating, rehabilitating people in the community. And then our hopes is that people become productive members of society. So as it relates to case management, like I said, all participants have to call into a drug screening line by 9 a.m. every single day to see if they're randomly selected. Um, if they are, they have to report as per whatever the time um, is left on the voicemail. Um, they do have to check in in the beginning with their case managers daily, and they have to check in with their probation officer weekly. Um, and then they're also required to follow through with the treatment plan that's created for them. So the treatment team does do a lot of that, but we take what the participants' needs are into consideration to develop that plan. Um, and then they all, there's a participant manual that all the participants have to follow. Um, so there are, it's quite um, strict, you know, there's things in there that they can and can't take um, because different medications, even multivitamins, things like that can trigger drug screens. And so there's a whole list of things in there too that they can and cannot consume. As it relates to cell phones, uh, participants are not allowed to have a cell phone in phase one. So they have to go back to the landline days, which I know we're all probably familiar with those, um, and make their phone calls that way. In phase two, they are able to apply for a cell phone, um, but they are subject to their phones being searched, wiped, etc., at the request of the treatment team. So that means at any point in time, we are able to look through their phones to see what they've been up to. I'm not going to go through our case management model because we don't really have a lot of time for that. Um, and that's more of the probation lens. But this is the five phase model that we follow. So this is what really guides and provides that structure for our participants and how we measure progress. So in phase one, they have court appearances bi-weekly. So Lethbridge Drug Treatment Court sits on the first and third Wednesday of every month. They have to attend probation weekly. They have to report daily. They have to attend residential treatment. This is the phase that we're really stabilizing in recovery. Um, they have to have housing that's approved by police and probation. Um, and so they can't just live anywhere. Um, we do conduct home visits as well. We're developing the case plan. They have to have financial income secured, medical issues addressed um, in order to progress to phase two, they have to complete 25 hours at minimum of volunteer hours. They have to attend two to four recovery meetings weekly, and they have to abide by a curfew, which is 9.30 p.m. to 6 a.m. As you'll see, um, that curfew extends as they build trust and um, demonstrate that they're able to follow through with um, the conditions put on them. And we do have police that do home visits, or um, sorry, curfew checks and also have um, phone calls that are made to make sure that they're home. If they're not, we'll talk about sanctions and rewards, but we are very on top of them. So even if they miss a single thing, there is um, some consequences that follow that. So in phase two, it's basically all of the same, um, but this is where they'll start to attend trauma counseling and start to really kind of take that deep dive into what's leading to their addiction. And then you'll see that their curfew it is now 11 p.m. to 6 a.m and they'll have to complete 50 volunteers. So you'll notice every phase progression, there's another 25 hours of volunteering that needs to be completed. Phase three, same kind of thing. Again, though, this is when, you know, if they're doing quite well, they can start looking at employment and or education. Um, this isn't about filling seats, though, either. So we're really looking at, are people engaged in the program? Not just going to counseling, but what are they actually working on? And, you know, 
how can we measure that? And so we're, we're in constant communication with um, their counselors um, when they're attending recovery meetings. They have to submit tracking sheets too that let us know that they've attended those things. And then we follow up to make sure that they've actually gone and they're not just you know, telling us what we want to hear. So there is a lot of supervision um, on our participants. And then curfew moves from midnight to 6 a.m. And so at this time, we're really looking at changing people, places, and things. And that's often the hardest part for people who are so entrenched in this lifestyle, is that's all they know. So phase four, same kind of thing. Um, they still have to abide by everything. Um, their recovery meetings change a little bit. They only have to attend one to two, but usually by this time, people are so engaged in what they're doing, it just becomes a part of their routine. Um, so that's really cool to see. And then they also no longer have a curfew to abide by. So by this time, they're really showing us that they're you know, committed to changing their life and we, we can trust them to be in the community, but they still have to report to us if they're spending overnight somewhere. I should also say too, early in the phases, in phase one, they're not allowed to leave the community. And so if they do, um, without us, um, you know, if, if there's a reason that they have to go somewhere, it has to be approved by us. They can't just go. Um, so we do keep a pretty close tab on where they're at and their business that they're conducting. And then in phase five, they only have to attend court once a month. And so that's usually the first Wednesday of every month. Um, you know, they're maintaining a sober network. They're demonstrating leadership in community and in the program. So sometimes, you know, people by this a, um, stage in the game, they're taking newer people to recovery meetings and showing them the ropes because drug treatment court often takes people who have never followed or had any structure in their life um, to it being very, very structured. Um, and that can be very difficult for, for participants as well. Um, and then at this point in time, they can make the application to graduate as well. So there is a whole application process that they have to follow to uh, be eligible to graduate. And then that gets reviewed by me and then the judges. And then if that's been approved, then we set a graduation date. So this is one of our judges. This is Judge Uishi. Um, and this was our first grad. Um, that, so he graduated in June. So we've only had one grad so far because our program is about 12 to 18 months for someone to from start to finish. Um, and we only launched in November of 2020, so it, we haven't been in operation in, uh, for too, too long, but um, to be able to graduate, some of the criteria is um, they have to show abstinence of a minimum of four consecutive months. So we do recognize that relapse is a part of recovery and sometimes people slip, right? And they're not punished for that, but the program is really based on honesty and accountability. And so if someone does slip up, every time they come in drug screen, we ask them if they have anything to disclose to us. If they do, we hope that they tell us. If not, the drug screens will tell us, and that warrants a different conversation. But you know, if people are honest about their relapse and their struggles, um, we do most likely send them for another round of treatment. If they're not honest about their recovery, that makes it very difficult, or sorry, honest about their relapse, it makes it difficult for us to work with them because they're not taking ownership of what's gone on. So things look a little bit different depending on their their response but overall we've had a really good relationship with the people that we serve and um, when there's been bumps in the roads it's treatment or maybe it's an adjustment to the treatment plan um, they also have to show a minimum of one year active engagement in the program and then complete stage five and then again the 100 volunteer hours and then that grad app has to be approved so we talk about sanctions and rewards a little bit. And so that's incentive-based therapy that focuses on positives rather than the negatives. And so if someone is compliant with their conditions and our participant manual, then they're rewarded in court. And so our court looks very different than a regular court sitting would. Um, so say you know someone, someone's done really well, we have a thing called a fishbowl. And so it's full of gift cards, about $5 gift cards, that they get rewarded for having a compliant week. Those rewards can also get bigger depending on where they're at in the program. Um, you know, sometimes they can go to concerts or maybe one guy really liked to play basketball, so we got him a basketball. So it really kind of just looks at, you know, what's important to them, but also, you know, how can we reward them? Because people, we all like being rewarded for the good things that we do. Um, but if someone is not compliant with their conditions, um, then we look at sanctioning them in court. And so that can be anything from a verbal warning from the judge 
um, all the way up to we can revoke their bail. So it really depends on what they've done. Jail is not, risk is contagious, so jail is not something we go to very frequently. Um, they have to show repeated non-compliance for us to, to seek bail revocation. Um, and it's not, you know, when we seek reward, or sorry, when we seek sanctions, it's not to punish them, it's to correct behavior. And so the sanction is usually in correlation with whatever the behavior that we're seeing. So if they miss appointments compete, or repeatedly, then we look at sanctioning them with community service hours. And so we start at four hours and then it builds to eight to 12 to 16. Once we get to those higher numbers, we're looking at bail revocation too, because clearly the sanctions we're seeking are not making a difference. Um, so does that kind of make sense to people on how that works? Okay. <laughs> To the five. Okay, I'll try to hurry real quick. Um, there is also an opportunity for people to become mentors once they graduate, and so because we only have one grad right now, he's really busy, he's moved back to Claire's home, um, he's not eligible to he doesn't he doesn't have the time to mentor but people do become or do have the ability to become mentors afterwards and so we currently use uh, an edmonton drug treatment court mentor uh, she's been sober for 15 years um, and so she comes down every couple months to hang out with them and she does a lot of virtual work with our participants as well so they have to be to be a mentor that's different than a sponsor that they get in the recovery meetings mentors are graduates of drug treatment court and so they know what it's like to walk that um, strict guidelines and that's kind of it in a nutshell so sorry if i rush through it but <laughs> Thanks, Josie. thank you all right well that's of course the majority of our presentation but uh, chelsea mentioned how drug treatment court looks even looks different than a regular court um, i've been doing criminal defense work for 30 years uh, and I'm very happy to be involved with drug treatment court for the, a number of those reasons that Chelsea has set out and the results that we're seeing. But how it looks from a court perspective is once the person has entered their pleas um, of guilty and accepted the facts, I then become their lawyer. So they will then communicate um, their questions to the Crown and other discussions that we have through me. Um, in terms of the court, um, you'll come before the court each week, but the judge will have given you ahead of time a question of the day, and every participant will be asked that. So they'll really develop a relationship with the judge. So they'll come and stand before the judge, talk about the question of the day, talk about how their time has gone, what's been working, what hasn't been working, and it's in a way that they've never done before a court. Most of our participants have extensive experience in court, and it's always has been them entering their plea, the judge giving them a lecture, and then either sending them to jail or giving them a fine or giving them probation. And that's been how their interaction works. There's never a relationship with the judge. There's never a sense of being uh, acknowledged by the judge or appreciated by the judge. Um, and that's all different in drug treatment court. So they will have that discussion. Then we'll talk about what's going, what is working for them. And one of the questions that's always put to them is, how many days clean and sober has it been? And someone will say, nine months, and we will all applaud. So it'll be the only time that they have come to court and been congratulated and been applauded for their accomplishments. So it has really developed a situation that I thought was unique in that it really becomes a community of the people who are in the program, um, their counsel, the prosecutors, uh, the judges and even to some extent the clerks. Um, people are amazingly articulate when you ask them about their addiction, when you ask them about their addiction recovery. Um, they're well able to uh, articulate a number of things that you wouldn't have thought of um, that really express themselves and gives the judge and all of the participants a chance to see them as people. So it is a very different court. And I know I don't have as much time, so I'll lap, leave that. And still yes, got, still got a couple minutes. Oh, okay. Um, I think it's a uh, I think it's a wonderful program. Um, as I say, I've been doing criminal defense work for 30 years, and while um, recidivists may be good for a criminal defense firm from a business perspective, it's a terrible thing for the community. Um, we have participants who have gotten in quite young into our program. 20, 21 years old who would have been experiencing a life of crime, who would have been doing this for 30, 40 years. 
and having that impact on the community in terms of not just the drug dealing, uh, but also the uh, ancillary effects of drug dealing. Drug dealing in front of your children, drug dealing in front of your families, in front of their communities, but also then theft, break and enters, breaking in to fund that addiction, to fuel that addiction. And if we can deal with that now or at any time, I mean, we have participants in their 40s and 50s, again, who had no particular motivation until drug treatment came along to quit. They couldn't see another path. Um, one of the things that uh, Gaber Mate in one of his books says is the addict can't even imagine a world without addiction. Can't even imagine it. Can't conceive of a world where they're not an addict. Drug treatment court is giving them a world where they're not an addict and we're not seeing all of those spillover effects. In fact, I mean, one of our participants is regularly communicate, uh, sorry, congratulated by members of his community because people can see that street people they used to hang out with can see the difference in them, can see the glow in them, and they're, what has changed for you? And he says, it's drug treatment court. I've gotten off drugs and I'm getting these supports and I'm presenting to my community, and now he's a leader in the recovery community and a leader in his own community because he's made those changes. And it's a drug treatment court that's allowed that to happen. So instead of his children and family seeing him as an addict, seeing him as a problem, seeing him as trouble, seeing as someone to stay away from. They're seen as someone to be drawn towards and someone to look to as an example. So, thank you. Thank you both very much. It's obviously a passion for you, <laughs> which I share. Now it's time for the Q&A session. So uh, if you'd like to ask a question, please come up to the microphone here, ask your question, and, uh, and then take a seat, and the answer will come up. Um, please state your name and your question briefly. No long preloads, please. And written questions can also be handed to me and read out if you prefer. Thank you. Thank you for a very interesting presentation. I have a couple of quick questions and then a sort of kudo left-handed compliment to follow. The quick question is, um, how many <coughs> clients do you have in each of the phases right now? And how many are there, how many drug treatment courts in Alberta? The compliment with left-handed compliment, your slide with the graduation was super in terms of the size of font, considering the, the type of room we have. A lot of the others weren't. <laughs> okay, first question was how many participants are in each phase? Um, we have two, I believe, in phase one. Actually, let's start at phase five. We have one currently in phase five, two or three in phase four. I have to really think about this. <laughs> um, a couple in phase three, a couple in phase two. So we only have seven participants in the program right now. Uh, we are in the process of um, terminating a couple people for not being able to follow through with the requirements. Um, and some people have gone on the run. And so that doesn't look very great either for them, but hey, we tried. Um, and so there's also, we also have seven applicants for this month, which is a record for drug treatment court in Lethbridge, which is really awesome. Launching in a pandemic wasn't, I mean, that posed a ton of issues, right? Because people weren't getting jail time or their, that carrot wasn't there to dangle. Um, Lethbridge Drug Treatment Court was the first expansion in the province. So Calgary and Edmonton have had drug courts for 15 to 20 years. Lethbridge was the first expansion, then Medicine Hat, then Red Deer, Fort McMurray, and, or Grand Prairie, and they're in the process of launching one in Grand, or Fort McMurray. Yeah. So Alberta has definitely put a huge emphasis on drug yeah. courts. Hello, my name is uh, Knut Peterson. Uh, just a quick little update on how we do this. Uh, if you could line up along that wall there, it would be great so you don't have to walk in front of the camera all the time. That would be really good. Thank you. Uh, my question, I have two questions actually. What 
Uh, what are the main issues that you've encountered so far with the program? And secondly, what is considered, what drugs are you talking about? Like, for example, uh, marijuana is legalized now, so that's not, is that considered, still considered a drug? Or, like, it seems to be a little bit of a moving target what, what drugs, what illegal drugs are. If they're prescribed by a physician, for example, they're not illegal. Uh, so could you talk a little bit about that, please? <laughs> All right, Brett, you might have to help me out with this, but it, we are looking at scheduled one drugs. And so that's usually, we see the primary drugs that we see that people are addicted to is meth and fentanyl, which are very, very deadly drugs. As we know, the opiate crisis has been around for quite a few years. Um, marijuana is legal, but our participants cannot consume um, alcohol or marijuana. Even if they're prescribed medication, they cannot take medication without us knowing um, because it'll trigger different panels on our drug screens, right? So um, it's not to say that they can't be taking medication for mental health, um, but we do have to know about that so we can keep in tune with what's being triggered on the drug screens and what isn't. Um, and what was the other? Is the main different? issues. Main issues, um, well, the racism in the community is very difficult to house our indigenous population. Um, it's it's a very very real thing um, and very difficult to to find housing for them, but also affordable housing. Um, that's an issue we've had in this community for many many years. Um, you know, especially when our participants can't work in the first couple phases, when they're only getting seven hundred dollars a month and rent is nine hundred plus, it's very difficult to even do that. We have partnered with Lethbridge Housing, and so we have a two bedroom fourplex in this community, but that only houses two people. We don't mix genders for various reasons um, and so you know there's just all those barriers that are stacked up against us too so um, yes as Chelsea said I mean we're primarily looking at um, schedule one drugs I mean we don't see a lot of uh, heroin here but it's fentanyl and methamphetamine are the big drivers in terms of um, issues um, it's a, an extremely um, tough program. Um, one of the things that's prohibited is things like energy drinks, right? We had a, a candidate sanctioned the other day for drinking energy drinks, right? You really have to commit to this program, and it requires some fundamental changes, right? And not only do you have to relocate, if you're going to a treatment program, what if you have children? You've got to make arrangements for your children to be cared for for that 60 or 90 days while you're going to the program? What if your uh, spouse or family members are remain in their addiction? Are you prepared to leave them? Right? Are you prepared to separate from them? Are you prepared to put them behind you? What about your children? Your child is a gang member or a gang associate. Are you prepared to cut them off to further your recovery? And that's been one of the challenges for all of our participants. They want to deal with their issues, they want to get their, but they're not prepared to make those extremely difficult choices and maintain those for 12 to 18 months. So it's not just, you can't see your son for a month, you can't see him for 18 months. As long as he's gang related, he can't be part of your recovery. And that's an extremely difficult thing to do. So people will sometimes get into the program and then realize in the, next, in the first 30 days, I can't do this. And one of the things our graduates said is, you have to completely trust a team of strangers, right? You've been involved in the drug and gang and criminal world, and it may well be that trusting strangers is how you got there. But now you've got to trust these people that you don't know, and they're going to run your life for the next, certainly through phase one, phase two, phase three, every day. And you've got to trust them. And, you've, and that's an extremely difficult thing to do for anybody, particularly if that hasn't been a path to success for you in the past. Hi, excellent presentation. I'm Barb Phillips. Couple small questions. Number one, because I think it might overlap into federal jurisdiction with some of their sentencing, is this funded 
municipally, provincially, or federally. And the second one is how has the city of Lethbridge received this program? I think it's excellent. It's We're starting somewhere because my experience with Lethbridge and our city in the last six months has not been very positive. And don't read roast and toast and don't uh, read letters to the editor in which they tell you that the NIMBYs, that out of sight, out of mind is the route to go in Lethbridge. Case in point, the encampment right outside of our window. Uh, anyway, that's my say. <laughs> Thanks. Should I answer it or should I let another question? Oh, answer. No, go ahead. Okay, okay. <laughs> You've had two questions, I think, the funding and uh, the City of Lethbridge. So funding does come provincial and federally. Um, the City of Lethbridge, I'm not really too sure what their buy-in is. We're trying to do more community presentation. So initially, um, Grace, who is the director from Edmonton Drug Treatment Court, did a lot of networking in this community prior to drug court even opening here. And so she did have chats with our mayor and council. However, our mayor and council has, has changed since then. And so not really entirely sure what their buy-in is. Um, this community struggles to acknowledge that people do struggle in this community. Um, and there's, you know, we, we have to have more compassion for those that are struggling. Um, you know, that someone's mom that's someone's dad brother sister um, you know my daughter's got relatives on the street and so you know we have to have some compassion and understanding and that's why we're here to share some of these programs because there are things that that do work um, but you know it, it's tough and I guess you know the lack of housing speaks to what's going on out there right and so we've been advocating for many many years for affordable housing um, if I can encourage you guys to do anything advocate for that too um, because we need housing with support people need help and even if they seem visibly able to work there's so much cognitively going on there for them that they need that support to get back on their feet to you know eventually work go to school and and get to where they want to be so thank you just be quick um i just wanted to acknowledge um the duty council is paid for by legal aid alberta legal aid alberta is a big believer in drug treatment courts and uh arranged for staff lawyer to staff all of the drug treatment courts in Alberta. Yeah. Maria Fitzpatrick and uh, my question is how do you establish a trust rapport? I've worked in cor or I've finished working in corrections but for 32 years and when I was able to establish a real trust rapport with parolees or inmates in the jail, I had success. But there, or I shouldn't say I did, they did, because whatever they do is their choice. But um, what do you do to get them on board with that choice? Relationships definitely don't come overnight. And it's that continuous meeting people where they're at, really listening to them and giving them that voice. Because oftentimes in corrections and things like that, right? They don't have a voice. It's just like, do what you're told. And you know, and there are some good people in those roles that can build those relationships, but it is about just really sitting with them and and it takes some time, but you know, through conversation and just really no judgment. Um, you know, and that that's hard to kind of explain but you you know these guys know who they can and can't trust pretty easy and and it does take some time to break those walls down but us showing up for them and supporting them and proving ourselves too right and if we're not genuine in our approach and our engagements with participants they know it and and it makes it very difficult to progress past you know that first hello thank you Uh, my name is Lori Schultz, and I'd like to thank both of you for a really awesome. wonderful, wonderful presentation today. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I, I have kind of three, hopefully small questions, but um, uh, you had indicated that um, clients have to, if they are working, have to leave their employment, um, which makes perfect sense for what's before them. Um, but I'm 
wondering if your program, and you may have touched on this and I, I missed it, but does your program involve employers, um, you know, and or family members? I think, Brett, you had mentioned that there are some, some family members that just, you know, don't work. But are there any other support programs specifically or support or keeping the relationship uh, between an employer and a client? Um, so the family and the work employer relationships, that's one question. I was just curious, for residential treatment, where would that be? I mean, what, what, do, what does Alberta have to offer with residential treatment programs, which, as I recall, uh, in my social work career can be very varied and, and such. And, uh, the third, I was just curious, you had mentioned that uh, if addicts, addicts are commercial addicts, like they're selling, what are the options for them um, how to, you know, to, to receive treatment and whatnot, but thank you. It's fully loaded. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess I'll start with the, the commercial. So really, when we talk about commercial drug dealers, I'd compare them to like the Hells Angels and people who are organized crime, right? Because that's a bigger system and most of those guys are employed and doing all those things and don't always have an addiction, right? They're just pushing the drugs to different communities and you know the, the lower level dealers that are dealing for them. Um, and so, I mean, they, they, they have, if they are addicted, they have access to treatment centers across Alberta, um, but it looks a little bit different because they lots of those guys don't actually have addictions themselves. And so that's where we kind of discriminate a little bit. Um, what was the other, <laughs> sorry. Oh, families. Oh, families and employment. Right, okay. So in regards to employers, our first graduate actually was employed when he came into drug treatment court. And so he actually had to go on EI. He had to explain to his employer that you know he had to do this or he was looking at jail time. Because you're gonna have to give up your job anyway, whether you're going to custody or you're going to drug treatment court. Um, and so we do have conversations. We're not super involved with the employers. They are, and so they're expected to have those conversations with their employers. Um, but we do have some people that are employed in the community where we'll write letters so they know that they're in drug court. Um, you know, if someone has to miss work because drug court is still a priority for them, um, we'll write letters just indicating and advocating for them and then they can produce that to their employer. So it is kind of a holistic approach a little bit. In relation to families, um, you know, we don't just look at rehabilitating the offender per se, we do look at the encompassing, right? So if there's family counseling or things that need to happen, we will um, put them all in counseling so that they can heal together. Um, you know, when we, Brett talked about if they are, you know, if they have people active in their addiction, like partners, let's say, we have put no contact orders in place between them. And that's very difficult to say, sorry, you know, you can't be with your husband or wife. But that's not permanent, right? It's just like, hey, if someone can get sober too, we can look at dropping that no contact order. But it's really those no contact orders are to protect the offender. But we do look at healing. Um, the whole, it's not just the individual, it's like what does what else does that look like? Um, and then for treatment, um, that's the other thing too. Treatment centers are not easy to come by. Um, and the wait list, right? If someone's like, hey, I wanna get sober, it's like, oh, sorry, six months down the road. It's like, well, holy cats, like how do we, you know, so then it's just survival and that's why supervised consumption sites were great because we kept people alive and breathing so that they could go to treatment when they had the opportunity to do so. Um, now without that, we just see a tremendous amount of deaths, but we do work with treatment centers that are quite familiar with drug treatment court because even when they're in treatment, they still have to attend court. So they attend virtually, of course. Um, we send a lot of our participants away. So we use a lot of tra treatment centers in Calgary, uh, out Lloyd Minister, Blackfoot area. Um, so they do go quite a distance, but um, it's because they have really good treatment centers. They're familiar with drug treatment court and they also offer some of them offer family programs, which is really great as we transi transition them back into community. Did that answer all of those questions? Yeah. Okay. Hi, I'm Barb McNeely Sears. I um, have three questions, hope I can remember them. One is how does that affect the, the program affect your crim criminal record? And the next one is, how many people have you, have you had to turn away people just because there is no housing I know with 
old family members we couldn't find rentals without even a problem going on hey yeah and then the other one is if they have uh, disabilities like attention deficit to have a schedule and a program like that sounds like very overwhelming and and you have people to help sounds overwhelming to me <laughs> you know so do you have somebody that really helps them to manage that you know medical issue thanks So our case managers are amazing and really help these guys walk through everything. Um, if people do have ADHD or other diagnoses, we do look at getting them on medication to help stabilize them and you know so that they can manage those things. And we often see a lot of people diagnosed or undiagnosed ADHD, and that's why they use meth, because it helps them stay focused. And so um, that's part of the... Um, treatment plan is if they require medication or something like that then we make sure that we assist them in doing so that they can be uh, successful in the program um, people do get terminated sometimes in the crown screening phase because their charges don't meet our eligibility criteria um, sometimes we have accepted people and this isn't very often where we've had to terminate people just because they had no follow-through but with that being said we had a guy who just wouldn't call us he lived in a different community um, fast forward to a year later he's in a different place now he's reapplied and we are looking at accepting him so even if they're maybe not motivated at that time and circumstances change they still have the opportunity to reapply at a later date um, so we are being more flexible in that because usually it was like a one time you do drug court or you don't and then that's it um, but we've kind of relaxed that um, eligibility criteria and did I miss criminal record? Was the criminal record. So they, Brett, you talk sure. about that. <laughs> yeah. So it's not like you receive a, a discharge. Um, you would still get a criminal record, but you would get a suspended sentence and probation. So your sentence would be suspended. You'd go on probation for a year, uh, with a number of the requirements that you would have had in phase five in terms of reporting, etc and that would be your criminal record. So you don't avoid a criminal record, but you do avoid jail. My name is Mike McCaig. My question is with reference to the Indigenous people that are in your program. My experience working with, uh, with the Sage Clan Patrol here in Lethbridge lately is that the successes that I've seen, some of them, very much revolve around the person returning to their indigenous heritage beliefs and programs and powwows and that type of thing. I wonder if you could comment on how much uh, interaction you have in that area with the indigenous people. So are we talking about like indigenous community or what? So I'm just wondering what, if you have uh, interaction with the indigenous community to help your clients to, to uh, go in that direction, if that's what they're going to try. Yeah, so we definitely do have a, we have a close, I personally also have a very close relationship with uh, the Blood Reserve. Um, but we do, lots of our guys volunteer with Sage Clan as well, that, and they absolutely love it. Um, they've done some expansion work with Sage Clan as well. The Indigenous Recovery Coach, so even our non-Indigenous participants are able to access the supports there as well, because sometimes, you know, AANA is very religious based, and sometimes that doesn't work for our participants, and so that gives them another opportunity to connect in a different way. Um, and we do work very closely with Blood Tribe Police and other uh, partners out on reserve to, to reestablish some of those connections. And you know, as Brett had mentioned, one of our participants, all of his crime for like a decade was on the reserve. And so him trying to reintegrate back into a community that's very small and that he did a lot of harm to has also been very difficult. And so, you know, some of those baby steps and, and really helping them out at different events that they have, we've been involved in that too. Uh, I'm Ian Hurdle. I really appreciated your sort of game-changing mentality that you are bringing your enthusiasm to this. Uh, it's nice to see a sort of a completely sideways step compared to what we normally see. Uh, 
incarcerating somebody in Alberta is about $140,000 a year on average. I believe that's fairly correct. What do you think the cost of this program is to get somebody through it? I have those stats. I just don't have them with me. Um, I can leave some business cards because there is, I do have some of those stats, I just don't have them with me. But, you know, if we look at these types of programs, they do save taxpayers, right? And that's where lots of people get kind of hung up on is my tax paying dollars. It's like, well, these actually, this works. Um, incarceration does not, and you actually just get better criminals after their sentence, so. My name is Mark Gettel. Certainly housing is a huge problem. There was a transition home being established at Scenic Heights, much to the chagrin of the neighborhood. They were predicting that their houses valued, will be devalued, et cetera, et cetera. Now this house, this transition home has been running now for I think approximately two years or so. So is this trans what is a transition home and is that part of your program or do you use these homes also in your program? So I believe that house you're referring to is a female only house. Um, and so that can be difficult because we only have one female participant in our program. She is residing there um, now. Um, and it, it is, you know, those programs work um, and we do use transitional housing because some of those pieces are important. Um, but we, if we, this is a little bit of a sidetrack comment, if we look at chronic homeless populations, transitional housing does not always work. We need permanent support of, housing because you know they can go stay there for two weeks or two months or whatever that looks like and then what right we still need that permanent solution where people can stay for a longer term but we do work really well with so i guess i should say too drug treatment court all of our drug treatment courts especially in lethbridge but in the province other than calgary we operate on a brokerage model so we delegate services out the only thing we offer in-house is the criminal addictive thinking so every other program in this community we've probably utilized um, because that's our that's our main goal is to get people connected to community so the more resources the better and so um, if those housing pieces are available to us we use them they also have a male house as well and one of our two of our participants have gone through that as well Bev Mundell Atherstone, thank you so very much. As um, a retired psychologist who spent my whole career in both education and, um, and working as a psychologist, I'm so happy to see a program that works on positive reinforcement because it's a much stronger reinforcer than um, the negative. So kudos, kudos to this program. Um, my, my question is, what kind of outreach do you do to the people who are currently homeless and are very much in the news? And do you also work with Alpha House and the, the um, drug van that's outside Alpha House in terms of finding people who uh, need the support? So there, there is conversation going on about, you know, how else can we serve other populations that might not be looking at one to five years, right? Because we have such strict criteria to get into drug treatment court, we can't serve everybody. I wish we could. So we're talking about, I mean, this obviously takes a long, uh, quite some time to do, but we're talking about different streams of drug court, right? So maybe there's people looking at less than one year. We do, we have taken people looking at nine months, but if we look at lesser sentences than that, they're not going to commit to drug treatment court, right? Because they can do two months of drug court and then be like, well, time served, see you later. Um, so <laughs> it's just not quite the same thing um, and so we because applications have to come through lawyers we can't really do the outreach component but with that being said one of our participants who is heavily involved in doing street outreach especially with the sage clan has started talking about you know what he's seeing on the streets and i'm like okay so how can we you know we need to kind of 
we see it, but it's like how many people actually have criminal charges that are warranting custody time, or what does that all look like so that we could better serve them? Um, but again, you know, these types of programs do not work well for people with fetal alcohol syndrome because they can't follow through. They don't get consequences. They they have a hard time following through, right? So these types of programs actually set them up for failure, and so we have to have, you know, they, we do have an FASD justice uh, project here which is an alternative justice stream for people with FASD. Um, but I, I wish I had a better <laughs> answer. Um, but we, we do our best to kind of meet the needs, but our, our criteria is so strict that it, and the application process that we, we have a hard time just going and doing outreach to connect with those people. Time for one more quick question. One more last one. <laughs> There's a question. There's a question. Oh. No, 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 go, go ahead. Uh, just a quick question. <clears throat> Is this a Made in Alberta program? And, and uh, regarding uh, what happens on the reserves, it's typically federal money and uh, so is there money from the federal government involved as well or is it strictly provincial? We have provincial and federal funding that kind of funds drug courts across Alberta. Um, there's a heavy influence of drug courts in the United States, and so all of the research comes out of the US. Um, but in the States, drug courts are mandated by um, judges, and so in Canada, it's more of a voluntary program. So they can choose to participate, then of course there's things that are not voluntary, like if you choose, you have to follow through. Um, but there is a heavy influence of drug courts in the US, and then they've expanded to Canada, but there's only a couple. There's one in Vancouver. Alberta has a heavy concentration of drug courts right now. Um, there's one in Saskatchewan and a couple further east, but we don't have as near as many as um, the states does. Federal, and if they're even if they're on reserve, their charges just have to be eligible. So it doesn't really matter if they're and they. I mean, they have to live in the city too. Um, but we work all those things out. But there is provincial and federal funding. But then just their charges make them eligible. Well, part of that they don't have to. It doesn't. The funding doesn't determine where our applications come from. One more question. My name is Patricia Buswell. It's a very practical question. I know you say you've only had one graduate so far, and so it, it's hard to maybe answer this, but what, supposing I were the graduate, what tangible thing do you give to me at the end of the program that I can take to employers to show that I have been you know, in, in this program and and I'm worthy of not just my past record. So as people progress through phases, they get certificates, and then when they graduate, they also get um, a certificate that says that they've completed it. And the bigger gift, though, is sobriety and the ability to show up to work every single day and the skills to navigate difficulties, right? And so, and the coping skills, healthy coping skills. So it's so much more than just their certificate. But the, also, the other thing, too, that I should mention is the Lethbridge police give them a challenge coin, and so that... I don't know if you guys are familiar with those coins, but it's kind of a military police thing, um, but it does, and so it'll give them, so Jacob who graduated got a number one on the back of the coin um, because he was the first graduate, and then as they progress, they'll get a different number, uh, but it's just things to, you know, as a reminder that, hey, you did this, and um, there's so much more than just um, the completion of the program that they got. Thank you again. That was absolutely wonderful, and thank you for the participation from the people asking the questions. Uh, I just have one more thing to ask. Is there any take-home message for the audience that either or both of you would like to come up and deliver? You go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, my take-home message is if you want a safer community, if you want less crime in your community, if you want less of those spin-off effects in your community, 
uh, then you'll support drug treatment court because we're trying to get to the root of those problems, solve those problems. Um, Chelsea, I mean, some of our people are, they range from 20 to 50 years old and will be facing a lifetime of criminality but for drug treatment court. So if you want a safer community, if you want less crime, if you want less of those spin-off effects on, on everyone in the community, then you would support drug treatment court. I guess my last comment is people can and they can change. Um, sometimes they just need that extra support and so that's what we're here to do.